If you don't want to vote for Nawaf Slim, fine. But at least offer a reasonable reason to not vote for him. That he has some relationship to the regime, that he served as an ambassador to the UN, that he has ties to politicians, established politicians, that he has represented the state long before October 17. If you're going to be so absolutist in your position and so Puritan and say that no one that was involved in politics prior to October 17 has the qualifications to serve as prime minister, even when you know that that person will not make it, the votes are set. Najimi Ati had at least 50 votes, if not more, uh, guaranteed. The fact is, it's not as big, perhaps, as people expected. It's not 75 or whatever it was last time around. It's 53 or 54, if I'm not mistaken. Regardless, that doesn't even matter. You don't, you know that Noef Slim won't make it. But you're offering reasons that don't add up for not voting for him. That's silly. At least offer a justified reason. You can't be so absolutist and be in politics at the same time. It just doesn't work. An absolutist on this man, I think is, uh, it shows a hint of arrogance, and I think it could also be ignorance too. And uh, they're both bad traits when it comes to what's happening. The truth is, this man would not be able to do much anyway, even if he was voted in. So Nawaf Slim is not a superhero. He cannot solve Lebanon's problems, even if he were voted in. Especially when it comes to judicial reform. He does not have the political backing or the security backing to push through reform that would actually untangle the security web we're stuck with. So Najimi Ati accepts things as they are. Now if Slim, let's say he wanted to push against the status quo, you would see him either being kicked out of office or his government forced to resign or his position paralyzed. And that's what's happened to every single politician that has tried to reform within the state the past decades. He's not special in that sense. But he is a reasonable name to vote for. He's a well-respected judge. He represents civil society. And I don't think uh, the absolutists or the Puritans should be the voice when it comes to trying to explain this man's history and politics. He is a decent human being, and I think it's embarrassing that the three change MPs that did not vote for him, their reasons, I, I don't just, they don't add up. That's one thing. Another thing is a uh, silly bus trip to Naura that uh, is supposed to what? represent an absolutist, maximalist position, so that a line that is maybe as arbitrary as any other line, but that line 29 should now be government policy, it should be voted into law, a line and a position that would guarantee no negotiations, it would guarantee no oil or gas exploration turning into anything worthwhile in a decade. It's ending it's ending uh, the exploration to begin with. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a position that's absurd. What are you doing? Line 23 may not be the ideal line. The Hoff line may not be good enough. The Hoff line that goes back now over 10 years ago. 55% of the disputed uh, zone goes to Lebanon, 45% to Israel. Let's say we demand more. Let's say we actually deserve more than that. Work within reasonable positions. And line 23 is not an absurd line. It's at least a starting point. And it was worked through relentlessly for years by well-intentioned people that were in the state, or at least represented the state. Not everyone that served in Lebanon's government in Lebanese history prior to that important landmark, October 17, is a criminal. That's extremism. And I don't think the change MPs should be extremists. And the whole word change, this name, for me, is everything. Don't do photo ops. Don't be seen cajoling to Hezbollah MPs when you don't need to. 
There are protocol procedures that are important. And yes, if you have to work with MPs that, let's say, are political more than uh, representing the militia, you have to work with them and you may even have to compromise at times or even, let's say, you agree on certain legislation with them, which is reasonable, I think, to assume. You don't have to be seen treating the regime MPs in particular, that party's MPs, as sort of uh, with respect and, and admiration. I think those photos that circulated were, were stupid. And we expect this from regime parties. Even the ones that scream loudest against Hezbollah or whatever, that claim to want reform the most, we expect this from the Lebanese forces. We expect this from other parties that say things and maybe then openly vote for Birri or whatever, quietly vote for Birri, whatever it is, that we expect the established parties that become nominal opponents to the regime, or to Hezbollah at least, we expect them to behave this way, but not change MPs. It's a mistake. It's a foolish mistake. Everyone has uh, been hard on Najat on Saliba, and I think her comments were probably the worst word choice possible in any moment when reflecting on the Speaker of Parliament's legacy in Lebanese politics. But when you make a when you make an error in judgment when it comes to word choice, don't double down and don't don't be seen as trying to be defensive or even for that matter uh, almost like um, unwilling to even unwilling to accept any responsibility for how that word madrasi could be reinterpreted in a way that maybe she did not intend obviously she ha she should have replied with a very straightforward retraction an apology or whatever would be necessary don't double down and become defensive and don't uh, be seen as perhaps believing believing that yes there is a lot to be learned by the way Nabih Birri has functioned in parliament because I think that's the message that came out it's wrong you should be able to accept your mistakes and move on and if you don't think it's a mistake at least acknowledge that the word was wrong I don't think she went far enough and I really respect her she may be among the most competent and uh, well-intentioned MPs, especially from the change group. I mean, she's a shining star in that sense. But uh, environmental policy and environmental issues are one thing. And being stubborn with those things is admirable when it comes to science. And maybe there's a stubbornness that comes to pushing in certain key sectors, pushing in reform or wanting to push in reform in certain key sectors. None of that is wrong. But then... Throwing it away for such a stupid uh, statement, I don't think it makes sense. And I referenced her name in particular because everyone knows who everyone knows that uh, that statement that was that went viral. But uh, I will actually I will mention another name. Um, I don't think Halima Kakur is doing anyone any good by uh, by saying uh, some of the most absurd uh, statements I've I've heard from the Change MPs. Whether it's with Nawif Slim or the trip to Naura with Line Twenty Nine and the uh, the absolutism in her in her language, um, she's right in in a sense that she was not voted in particularly to address Hezbollah. She's voted in because she represents change and a break to the status quo. But Hezbollah cannot be ignored. I think a more honest reply to any television outlet or journalist or whoever is pushing her or pushing any of the change MPs when it comes to this huge issue that they don't really have much agency over to begin with. I think a more reasoned, more rational reply would be we don't have the tools. We don't have the tools to negotiate an end to Iran's security burden on Lebanon. Those that have tried before paid the ultimate price. 
Those that will try again in the same fashion will pay the ultimate price. There is no reason to repeat what is known today, that is, there is a line that you cannot cross in Lebanon when it comes to Iran's security in this country. There is a consequence. But you should be able to say, we recognize the special tribunal for Lebanon's verdict. We acknowledge that we cannot do anything to arrest those names that were mentioned, Hezbollah members that are at large, trial in absentia, Lebanese state cannot arrest these people. That should be, that should be stated, should be mentioned. And the messaging is unclear. There should be a very careful and clear message, which is, we want an end to Iran's security needs in Lebanon, period. We used to have diplomatic tools that were thrown away when this country lost its independence. We cannot negotiate with Iran directly. Hezbollah is Iran's machine in Lebanon, and Hezbollah is Lebanon's ambassador to Iran. That's not diplomacy. That's sabotage, and that's security dominion. But the messaging at least should be there. At least explain why we cannot do anything to arrest criminals. Explain why Tarab Bitar cannot fulfill his mission. Explain why, or at least offer an explanation as to why there is no judicial reform so long as this machine is entrenched. You can't just let, you know, 17 years is a long time. And the Special Tribunal for Lebanon is a very dissatisfying uh, process, I think, to anyone that wanted to see a change when it came to at least political reform and security for politicians to push through reform that infringe on Hezbollah's dominion. That's all been, that's now just, it's over. But you can't throw away the benefit of knowing the truth. You can't throw away the benefit, the long-term benefit of seeking justice. And you can't just keep saying we need investigations to uncover what happened can't emphasize local investigations in Lebanon. They don't go anywhere. They stall. Tarab Bitar, has, his mission was paralyzed months ago. We're approaching a year now, nine months, ten months. It'll soon be a year since Tayune. Tarab Bitar cannot do his job. Political assassinations, you can't go after Hezbollah. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon did. It's an exception. And its mission is beyond Lebanese geography. That's the exception. And it showed us exactly what was happening. Don't dismiss that as just politics as usual. I understand there's a lot of caution, especially among the change MPs. For that matter, actually, anyone that talks about this issue but then doesn't do anything about it. There's a lot of caution. There's fear that once you go down this road, it exposes you. Fine, but at least acknowledge that and say we want we don't have the tools for diplomacy. We demand that any country that engages with Iran make it clear that Lebanon should be on the table. And at least now we have 13 MPs. If Lebanon is ever going to be at that table, it should come from this crowd. It should come from the change voices. There is now an independent collection of new names that should take on the burden. They can't shy away from this. And that is how things move forward slowly. That is how change happens, slowly. But there's no other way to do it. You can't just hide behind and assume that this is not your burden and try to move around on the periphery and cosmetics. That's not change. That's exactly what everyone's been doing for, the, for the, at least the last 17 years, if not longer. So there you have caution within MPs. There's also a, a caution among many, perhaps, uh, I don't know if they're, they're not politicians, but they are, maybe they're persuasion artists. I don't know if I fall into that category. Maybe I do as well. They could be academics. They could be in think tanks. They could be advisors, or maybe they're even citizens that want to play a role in politics. There's an undercurrent of accept Hezbollah and move on. And I think that's a dangerous road for Lebanon. 
uh, the example that I hear a little too often, which I think is so rotten in terms of its uh, legitimacy, it, uh, it's robbed of meaning. The Christians played a role in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, the Sunnis replaced the Christians in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. The Shia are now the ones claiming the throne, and we, we need to just accept this the way it is. That's how Lebanon functions. I think that's a misreading of Lebanese history. That's a forgiving, that, that's a, that's a pandering to sub-state actors and external players and armed groups that are not made up of Lebanon or Lebanese for that matter. These are, you can't, can't disassociate. Fatah and the Syrians and Hezbollah and assume that this is just Christians, Sunni and Shia. This is silly. Actually, that is what killed Lebanon. But this forgiveness towards Hezbollah saying that we should not talk about them or we should let it go or we should even be accepting of it or pander, work with it, become a minister in a Hezbollah friendly government and drop the issue. I mean, that is exactly the political consequence of what Hezbollah has done to this country. I appreciate that there's limited capability when it comes to even economic reform. Uh, there isn't that much that can be done at this moment, given the status quo, when it comes to addressing reform within most sectors. I appreciate that geopolitics is not the domain of most MPs, whether it's the regime or the opposition or the change block or whatever. And I know that anyone that enters power today, well-intentioned or ill-intentioned, uh, they're faced with circumstances that are not good. And I know that it is difficult, and I know that there's a lot of uh, innocence in the story, there's a lot of learning on the go. I want reformists to win. And I want the nightmare to end. And I want at least policy offered in terms of how to end the burden that is Iran in Lebanon. Short of that, the exercise is meaningless. And um, I'm sorry, but Cynthia Zarazir, her, re her reasons today, at least the way she, expre the way she expressed them, fall short. Halima Kakur, her maximalist endeavor when it comes to Nawaf Slim, it's misguided. Uh, yesterday, I, I know that he may have it even harder, and he's not coming from uh, a forgiving uh, terrain when it comes to how to talk about, at least when it comes to Hezbollah, even beyond Hezbollah. I understand that there could be some constraints. When, at least when it comes to how he expresses the path forward for reform. But uh, you can't abstain from Nawaf Slim and just call it a day and say that, you know, he doesn't represent us. Put someone else's name. If you're so pure in your intention, offer a Puritan. And it can't be that none exist. I mean, there are people that, there. these are voices in parliament. Put a name down. I think it's silly. I'm sorry to use this word over and over, but it's silly. And I think Firas Hamdan is actually uh, quite a courageous person. And, you know, the man was shot. And he's young, charismatic. There's a, he almost died. And he's still uh, able to be at least articulate and uh, principled. I admire this man. But I'm, I don't know. I expected more maybe early on. And now I'm coming to terms with expecting less long term. But uh, don't hide. Don't pander. Don't, don't duck for cover. Stand tall. Even if you don't care for Rafi Hariri, stand tall for justice. There are successful and unsuccessful uh, assassinations within the Special Tribunal for Lebanon from 2004 to 2005. You hate everyone that was in politics then and you think that it doesn't matter whether they're in politics today or not. But the fact is they're killed. They didn't just pass away from natural causes. Stand up for an end to murder. 
Stand up for that. And respect the verdict, even if it's 17 years late. At least acknowledge it. Not a whimper, not a, not a, not a word. You know, the only words that were actually articulated are from groups that are not in politics right now, from the change block. They're not in parliament, and they were able to express themselves better. You're in parliament. Stand tall. Don't, don't sit down and duck, and don't... I think uh, there's a missed opportunity, and uh, I know circumstances are hard to change, but uh, if you're working for change, you need to change the circumstances, and that hasn't happened yet. Thanks.